Let's open our Bibles this morning to the book of Numbers, chapter 32, chapters 32 through 36, final preparations. Israel has been led out of Egypt by the Lord, taken down to the tip of Sinai Peninsula, to Mount Sinai. God has revealed himself to Israel made covenant promises with them, given his laws, and then he has led them to the promised land. At the end of two years, they arrive at Kadesh Barnea, ready to enter the promised land. They're afraid, and they want to send spies in to see if what God said was true, that the land was flowing with milk and honey. So one tribe uh, each had offered up a spy, And they went in, 10 spies saw the giants and said, we can't take them. Two of the spies said, we can. God says it, we will do it. So God says, because of your unbelief and your fear, your lack of faith, none of the men over the age of 20 will enter into the promised land. You cannot enter God's blessings apart from faith. So then begins the longest death march in history. For the next 38 years, they will wander, mostly in that Kadesh Barnea area, they will wander until every single man, 20 years and older, dies. And then only two men will be allowed to enter into the Promised Land who were there on that first attempt 38 years before. Caleb and Joshua. Other two men who believed God are not going to be able to make it. Aaron, the priest, and Moses. Both of those men dishonored God on one occasion when the people were thirsty and God said simply to Moses, speak to the rock and the rock will bring forth water. But Moses was angry. He was impatient. He took his rod and struck the rock twice and thereby misrepresented and disrespected God. God said, because of that, neither of you two men will enter into the promised land. Sad, but to whom much has been given, much is expected. So we're getting ready now to make preparations. We saw last week that Moses was man enough to say, all right, I can't go in, then you find someone who will take them in. God chose the man who had been there all along, Joshua. And so Joshua is going to be the one who will have the privilege of leading them into the promised land. But preparations are being made now for this journey. God has taken Moses up to the top of Mount Nebo on the eastern side of the Jordan, with present day Jordan, and allowed him to see the land that Israel was going to claim. He couldn't walk on it, couldn't put his foot on it, but he could see it, and so God was being gracious to give him that. Forty years, he had led three million people, complaining most of the time, the most difficult pastoring job ever given to any human being. But he was faithful till the end, except for that one situation, and now he is giving instructions and plans to enter into the Promised Land. We're gonna see today these final preparations as uh, two and a half of the tribes want to stay on the eastern side where they are. They don't wanna enter into the Promised Land. We're gonna see how Moses gives a review and a preview because he's talking to the younger generation. Most of these folks weren't even born 38 years before when the spies failed to enter in. God is going to then give the boundaries for this land. He is going to appoint special cities for the Levites and places of refuge. And then he is going to take care of the situation of land passing to daughters as well as sons. So God has preparations for our lives and there's a lot of application. Let's make that as we go through this time. What he did for them, he wants to do for us as well. He has a plan for our lives. We need to trust it. Amen? Let's go to the Lord. Father, we're grateful for this chance to study your word. Help us to really trust you to set the boundaries for our lives and make all of the provisions from this day forward. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Chapter 32, we're going to talk about the uh, two tribes and a half a tribe want to stay right where they are on the eastern side and not cross over the Jordan and enter into the promised land. Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of livestock. And when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that indeed the region was a place for livestock, the children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spoke to Moses, to Eleazar the priest, and to the leaders of the congregation, saying, Ataroth, Dibon, Jazer, Nimrah, Heshbon, Elilah, all these names, the country which the Lord defeated before the congregation of Israel is a land for livestock, and your servants have livestock. Therefore they said, If we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants as a possession. Do not take us over the Jordan. Well, that was a bit of a surprise to Moses and to all the people who heard that. They spent another 38 years, 40 years altogether, to get to the Jordan River to cross over. That was their goal. They lived for that morning, noon, and night. And now, two and a half of the 12 tribes don't want to go. And they're making an assessment based upon observation, which is not a wise thing to do. It's a human thing to do, but it's not a wise thing to do. They look at the land. It is great for livestock. These two and a half tribes have a lot of livestock. It makes sense. In the natural, it makes sense. We've got the livestock. Here's the capability to feed them. We're not sure what's over there. We want to stay here. What do you do when somebody does not want to enter in and go forward with a plan? Well, well let's see what, how they're going to handle this. Verse 6. Moses said to the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war while you sit here? So things are peaceful here, but there are giants in that land. Are you going to stay here and let us fight these battles alone? Now why will you discourage the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord has given them? Thus your fathers did when I sent them away from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. When they went up to the valley of Eshcol and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the children of Israel, so they did not go into the land which the Lord had given them. So the Lord's anger was aroused on that day, and he swore an oath. None of the men who came up from Egypt from 20 years old and above shall see the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me, except Caleb and Joshua. So the Lord's anger was aroused against Israel. He made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until all the generation that had gone evil and had done evil in the sight of the Lord was gone. And look, you have risen up in your father's place, a brood of sinful men to increase still more the fierce anger of the Lord against Israel. For if you turn away from following him, he will once again leave them in the wilderness and you will destroy all these people. So Moses was thinking, here we go again. Or as the great Yogi Berra would say, deja vu all over again, right? This is what happened 38 years ago. You refused to enter the land and all of the adults had to die. And you guys don't want to go in. Here we go again. So we got a problem. After all this time, they were not ready to fulfill the promise that God had given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What do you do? And this happens in our lives as well. We have plans we feel are from God, and then certain members of the family balk at those plans and don't want to go forward. What do you do? You go to God and say, not we have a problem, but you have a problem. How do you want to handle this? And this is not easy. If you have a family, you know what I'm talking about. Not everybody's on board. Not all of them are ready to go God's way and fulfill the plan. So what you have to do is instead of getting angry, you go to God, you shift the responsibility to him and say, what do you want to do? Well, how are we going to solve this? Verse 16, then they came near to him, that's the children of Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh. We will build sheepfolds here for our livestock and cities for our little ones. But we ourselves will be armed, ready to go before the children of Israel until we have brought them to their place. And our little ones will dwell in the fortified cities because of the inhabitants of the land. And we will not return 
to our homes until every one of the children of Israel has received his inheritance. For we will not inherit them on the other side of the Jordan and beyond, because our inheritance has fallen to us on this eastern side of the Jordan. So he's saying, what they're actually saying here is, we understand, we're not going to leave you alone. Let us stay here and take care of our flocks and build pens for them, take care of the cities. We'll leave our wives and our children here. We'll go before you, we will fight the enemy, and we will not come back to our land here on the eastern side of the Jordan until that land is settled for you. So that seems to be a reasonable compromise, if you will. It makes sense. They're not willing, they're not afraid to do their part, but they really are set on that land. So verse 16, or verse 20, Moses said to them, if you do this thing, if you arm yourselves before the Lord of the war, and all your armed men cross over the Jordan before the Lord until he has driven out his enemies from before him, and the land is subdued before the Lord, then afterward you may return and be blameless before the Lord and before Israel, and this land shall be your possession before the Lord. Notice how he is, for clarification purposes, restating what they're saying. You need to be clear in families, in business, in communication, you need to be absolutely clear. Many problems arise in relationships because of a lack of clarity, a lack of communication. So what you're saying is, and then you restate it to make sure that we all agree, that's what he's doing here. But, and this is also important, if you do not do so, then take note, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. In other words, if you don't fulfill your promise, you will pay the price. But spill cities for your little ones, foals for your sheep, do what has proceeded out of your mouth. And the children of Gad and the children of Reuben spoke to Moses, saying, Your servants will do as my Lord commands. Our little ones, our wives, our flocks, and all our livestock will be there in the cities of Gilead. But your servants will cross over, every man armed for war, before the Lord to battle, just as my Lord says. So Moses gave command concerning them to Eleazar the priest, to Joshua the son of Nun, to the chief priests of the tribes of the children of Israel. And Moses said, If the children of Gad and the children of Reuben cross over the Jordan with you, every man armed for battle before the Lord, and the land is subdued before them, then you shall give them the land of Gilead as a possession." Notice how not only is he clear with the leaders of these two and a half tribes, he now goes to the rest of the leaders of Israel and makes sure everybody is on board. Everybody knows what's going on. And um, he says, if they do not cross over, armed with you, then they shall have possessions among you in the land of Canaan. So if they don't fulfill their promise, then they will settle on the western side, the promised land of Canaan. Then the children of Gad... And the children of Reuben answered, saying, As the Lord has said to your servants, so we will do. We will cross over armed before the Lord into the land of Canaan. But the possession of our inheritance shall remain with us on this side of the Jordan. So Moses gave to the children of Gad, children of Reuben, and half the tribe of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, the kingdom of, and these are the kingdoms on the eastern side, of, of King Sihon, King Og, all the cities, and um, all the different cities here are named. That was all given to these two and a half tribes. So we seem to have resolved the problem. Seem to. And so life is that God gives a plan. We feel we've heard from God. We move forward as a family, as a congregation, as a nation. And some people don't like the plan. And they've got another plan. And so we have to work this out in compromise. And so we agree that if you'll fulfill your end of the bargain, then so be it. Everybody is on board. All the leaders have been apprised of this. And again, communication is vital. We know that one of the biggest reasons why marriages fail is because of a lack of communication. And so with any relationship, in business, in ministry, what have you, a lack of communication. We need to all be on board. And so it seems fine. But what did God say and what was God's plan? We have to go back to that. 
I think this is how I'm going to live my life. But what did God say? And what did God want? Did God ever say that he wanted for two and a half tribes to not enter into the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Didn't he want all the tribes to go in there? But they balked at that. They didn't want to do it. Oh, sure, they're going to compromise and they're going to help them settle the other uh, tribes into the other parts of the land across the river, but that wasn't God's plan. We need to get into the mindset, what does God want? Not what do I think is best. What is your plan, God? Yeah, the pastures look great. But had they looked back at history, they would have realized that's a very bad move. Had they gone back to the days of Abraham, and the tradition was passed on down to them, they knew about Abraham's nephew, whose name was Lot, and they had so many flocks and herds, there wasn't enough land. And so Abraham said to Lot, you choose which direction you go, and I'll go in the opposite direction. And so Lot looked down at the fertile plains of Sodom and Gomorrah and said, that's rich pasture land. And I'm going to go by the natural observation of my eye and say, that's what I want. And so he went down there and we know the rest of the story for him, don't we? He went from the pastures into the city, became a judge in the city, and eventually had to flee with his daughters because of the outpouring of wrath from God. Bad decision. Well, what's wrong with these two and a half tribes staying over on the eastern side of the Jordan? Looks good at this point. Fast forward in history, and you're going to find that uh, a few hundred years later, we're talking 1,500 years before Christ, by 721 B.C., Assyria, modern-day Iraq, is going to come on in and devastate as much of the country and the world as they can. Guess where they're going to hit first? The eastern side, the unprotected side of the Jordan, and take the northern kingdom and much of that population into captivity. Later on, another few hundred years in 586 B.C., Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar is going to come on in and take much of the world. And who are they going to hit first? The two and a half tribes. So they're going to really have problems. They've traded what looks good today for a catastrophe tomorrow. I know that God has a plan for me, but with all due respect, Lord, I've given my heart to Jesus. I know I'm heaven bound. But I've been given a mind, and I've been given a will, and I do subscribe to Frank Sinatra's song, I did it my way, and that's us. That's how we feel. And so they're going to pay for this price very badly. We ought to just decide, let's go God's way. It doesn't make sense. We've got green pastures here, but God didn't ascribe this for us. There's that special young man or young lady that I think is just, just right for me. There's this job that's just right. There's this ministry. There's this vehicle, this home. And I know it's right. And I can't say that God's in it. In fact, I think he's saying no, but I know better. I know that it's right for me. And I'm going to serve God. I'm going to actually give him a little extra money. I'll tithe and do a half another tithe. And I'm going to make it up to him because I know this is what I need and want. And how many of us do that? Now, the unbeliever doesn't know God, and the unbeliever doesn't try to serve God. But for the one who has surrendered, remember, when you give your life to Christ, you're not only asking him to save your soul, but to be the Lord and the master of your life. And that means he makes the decisions. And so when you come to him, you surrender your free will and say, I will not go my way, but I'll go your way. Well, these folks are going to go their own way. They will pay a very heavy price. Chapter 33, Moses now is going to bring the younger generation up to speed on what's been happening over the last 40 years. He's going to talk about the itinerary of where they have come from. In uh, his final address, he's going to instruct them to drive out the Canaanites and to destroy all the pagan worship sites and to possess the land. And he's going to give them a warning from God that if they fail to remove the Canaanites uh, and all their trouble, God's going to have to then expel them. Uh, the lesson we saw for chapter 32, I think, was what looks the best may not be the best. Satan knows how to make things very attractive. Our flesh knows how to make things very attractive. Not my will, but thine be done. Jesus wrestled with that in Gethsemane. He was balking 
at the last minute in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, if there's some other way to save Jerry Lynn than my going to the cross, I'm asking for that plan. And that goes for anybody else who would come to Christ. He wanted another plan. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He didn't have the victory with that first prayer. He was sweating, as it were, great drops of blood. And he prayed again. And he still didn't have the peace. But he prayed the third time, and he had the victory. Thy will be done. And God did not relieve him from that obligation. Thank God for us. But he sent angels to strengthen him, and he finished his task. What looks best might not always be the best. You know better than I, Lord, what's best for me. Now in chapter 33, we're going to see that we need to deal with sin before sin takes us out. Destroy sin before it destroys you. And teach the young generation what they should know. We had some little children come in today who were new and uh, a couple of ages, 11, 9, and I forgot the third. Then it was a little two, two-month-old child that just came in. Never too young to really learn about the Lord and be in the house of God. Good place to bring your child, even a two-month-old. It's even the atmosphere is going to bless that child and thank God for the parents who were obedient. But we need to teach the children about God. Eh, they can get it on the internet. Eh, they can get it at, at public school. Eh, they can get it with their friends after. No, 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 no. Uh, well, they can get it at church. Don't even trust the church. Not saying that the church is wrong, but don't feed your kids once a week. Why would you want to teach your children to eat only one meal a week? They'd starve to death. And so don't let us do all the feeding. You do the feeding there. Uh, sing with the kids. Worship with the kids. We use some of the praise songs downstairs that we use upstairs. The idea being that the parents and the kids can sing the same songs during the week and can sing them together. Every day they should be feeding upon the Word of God and praising God. So teach them about their history. Teach them where they have come from and where they're going because they need to know that. So beginning in verse 30, chapter 33 and verse 1, these are the journeys of the children of Israel who went out of the land of Egypt by their armies under the hand of Moses and Aaron. Now Moses wrote down the starting points of their journeys at the command of the Lord, and these are their journeys according to their starting points. They departed from Ramses in the first month, on the 15th day of the first month, on the day after the Passover. The children of Israel went out with boldness in the sight of all the Egyptians. And I love that for the record. Um, I don't know that I see boldness. When they left, I think I saw a lot of fear. How about you? As they were being chased by the pharaohs and the armies. But this is what God says. And um, I could look at you with a critical eye and say, I think you're not walking in the fullness of what God has. I could look in the mirror and say the same thing. But in Christ, God does not see condemnation. And in Christ, God does not see failure. He sees victory. And so I could pick apart some of the actions of your children but you love your kids and maybe you've disciplined them when they did wrong, but they're your kids. And you will not accept any kind of condemnation from me on the actions of your kids because you love them. And so God loves these dear people and he sees they went out with boldness. So if that's how God sees it, forget Jerry's opinion, they went out with boldness. All right, the Egyptians were burying all their firstborn whom the Lord had killed among them. Uh, also on their gods, the Lord had executed judgments. Remember these judgments, these plagues, were not only on the Egyptians for refusing to let the Israelites go. These judgments were on the so-called gods, the competing gods to the one true God. The children of Israel moved from Ramses, camped at Sukkoth. They departed from Sukkoth and camped at Etham. They moved from Etham, and then you're going to see a lot of names in here. Um, and the solution, if you want to know how to pronounce these names, pronounce them quickly, okay? I'm always amused to hear my messages, how I pronounce it a certain way in verse 3, and a totally different way in verse 9, and a third way. And I figure, hey, I'll cover the waterfront. Who cares, right? Um, they departed, verse 8, from Heroth and passed through the midst of the sea into the wilderness. They passed through that Red Sea. They went three days' journey in the wilderness of Etham and camped at Marah. Uh, that was a wonderful miracle as God parted that sea. 
Oh, you'll hear people who will say, well, it was only uh, a very narrow little waiting proposition. Well, the Bible says they walked over on dry land, and then when God brought the waters back, it drowned the entire Egyptian army. So if they could be drowned in a couple of inches of water, then that's a great miracle too. But God says it was dry land, and then it came over and washed over them. It was the real Red Sea, to be sure. Well, they moved into the wilderness of Sin, verse 11, camped at Dafka, and uh, all the different names here. They moved in verse 16 through the wilderness of Sinai, and uh, they departed from there, went to Hazaroth, and all these different names, which you can go back and read this afternoon after you've had a nice lunch, okay? And it will get you ready for a long winter's nap, to be sure. Uh, and let's see, verse 38, Aaron the priest went up to Mount Hor at the command of the Lord and died there in the 40th year after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt on the first day of the fifth month. And Aaron was 123 years old when he died on Mount Hor. We all talk about Moses living to 120. He died in the same year, but Aaron was three years older. And uh, he had a good ripe age of 123 years. Now the king of Arad, the Canaanite who dwelt in the south in the land of Canaan, heard of the coming of the children of Israel. So they departed from Mount Hor and camped at Zalmanath and the different places. They had opposition as they were moving and all the different locations you can see there. And you've got a map that will show you um, all these different positions. And um, if you want to follow that, that's rather interesting reading as well. And uh, you'll see the full extent of their journey right up to the point we're talking about today. And verse um, 49, they camped by the Jordan from Beth Jezimoth as far as Abel Acacia Grove in the plains of Moab. They're getting ready to go into the land. Now verse 50, God's going to give instructions uh, for the conquest. Again, wait on the Lord for your instructions. Don't just begin to reason and be intuitive and talk to advisors and friends. Go to the Lord. Now God can use advisors, good Christian counsel, but that's only to confirm what God gives you. You need to go to the Lord and hear from Him, and you need to go each and every time. Later on, many years later, we're going to see about 500 years later, King David, who was going to have trouble with the enemy, the Philistines. And on one occasion, he says to God, how do I proceed militarily? And God basically says, a frontal attack. And he defeats the Philistines. Not long after they come back, he's wise enough to say, do I go, Lord, the same way? He asks the Lord, and the Lord says, no. This time you go around the rear and get them that way. Point being, every time, go to God. It might not be the same answer. And don't assume that we know God's mind. Verse 50, the Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you have crossed the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, destroy all their engraved stones, destroy all their molded images, and demolish all their high places. You shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell in it for I have given you the land to possess. And you shall divide the land by lot as an inheritance among your families. To the larger you shall give a larger inheritance, and to the smaller you shall give a smaller inheritance. There everyone's inheritance shall be whatever falls to him by lot. You shall inherit according to the tribes of your fathers. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, that it shall be that those whom you let remain shall be irritants in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and they shall harass you in the land where you dwell. Moreover, it shall be that I will do to you as I thought to do to them. So God is giving very specific instructions. And they know what to do. They know what to expect. Verse 51 Moses' main job is a conduit, just simply to hear from God and pass it on to the people. The father of the home, the mother of the home, they're conduits to pass on what God says for the children. Uh, the pastor in the church, the president of the United States, the leader in business, 
is a conduit. If he's a Christian and she's a Christian and just whatever God says, you share with others. Uh, this is not about us directing people's lives, but hearing from God and passing it on. That's the safest and only way to really operate. Well, here's what he says. When you've crossed the Jordan, verse 51, you're going to drive out the inhabitants of the land, destroy their engraved stones, their molded images, and demolish all their high places. They're false places of worship. God had the nation of Israel down in Egypt for 400 years. And those 400 years were to cause these 75 people to grow into a nation of 3 million and draw them to God. But those same 400 years were to give the inhabitants of the land of Canaan enough rope to hang themselves. 400 years to worship false gods. Remember, God is not just working with me, he's working with others. And so he was building the nation of Israel and he was really getting fed up with those in the land of Canaan because of their idolatry. And so now the time is ripe. They are ready to be thrown out because of their wickedness. And God says, you destroy all vestiges of their worship. You're not going to be like them. He says to us, we're to be holy and be separate and not be unevenly yoked together with unbelievers. We should not be walking the way of the world, dancing the world's tune. We should be walking with and being separate unto the Lord. Well, he says here that if you don't drive them out, he says, I'll give you the land by lot in verse 54. More, get, uh, more people get more land, obviously. Uh, if you don't drive them out, verse 55, then they're going to be an irritant to you. That's a good lesson for us, isn't it? There'll be irritants in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and they're going to harass you in the land where you dwell. So when there is sin in my life, and I don't take authority over it, I don't get rid of it, it's going to continue to irritate me, it's going to harass me, it's going to make me absolutely miserable. And he says about this idolatry and throwing out the Canaanites, if shall be that I will do to you as I thought to do to them. If you don't throw them out, if you don't turn away from their ways and come to me, then I will do to you what I did to them. God is no respecter of persons. And so he's not going to play favorites. Now, I know he plays favorites with me. The rest of the body of Christ needs to follow him or there are consequences. But God loves me. I can do whatever I want and I'm going to escape with impunity because I'm Jerry. And uh, how many in the world think that way? Kids and families. I'm special. I'm special. They go into the army or the air force and I'm special. The sergeant's going to let me sleep a little longer in boot camp and what have you. On that job, I don't need to follow all the rules and regulations. In school, I can turn my papers in late. I'm special. Many go through that and they find out pretty quickly we're not special. And uh, again, to whom much is expected, is given much is expected. So fast forward, Israel is going to go into the land. They're going to encounter the Canaanites. They're going to drive out some and not drive out others, but they're going to be attracted to the evil, idolatrous ways of worship. And they're going to begin to worship these so-called gods and goddesses and leave these shrines. Oh, in the beginning, they're going to take the shrines and convert them into a place of worship for Jehovah. And then they're going to be moving right into worshiping Baal. And the kings are going to do this in many cases. Most of the kings of Judah in the south are going to be wicked. The two most wicked kings of all will be Manasseh and, believe it or not, the very son of David, Solomon. Those two kings alone are enough to throw that land in the south into captivity in Babylon in 586 BC. To the north, they will not have one good king, not one. And Assyria is going to take them into captivity in 720 and uh, it's going to be wicked. And what's God going to do? He throws them out of the land just as he promised. So um, be sure your sin is going to find you out, he's saying. And uh, we're not special. We're special in that we're saved and God loves us, but Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Not if you love me, do whatever you want. All right, chapter 34. Let's look now at the boundaries. And I find this to be important. 
Um, it seems like dull reading, but if you've ever had property, you know that boundaries are important. How about boundaries in the house? Boundaries on who's going to sleep where, what kids are going to sleep where, and boundaries on who's going to have the use of the bathroom or bathrooms and when and what have you, at work, etc. Uh, God has boundaries. Verse 1 of chapter 34, we're going to see how God gives uh, these boundaries. And uh, we're going to see that he has certain people to execute that. And uh, I think the lesson for chapter 34 is that as God establishes Canaan's boundaries, may he also establish our boundaries. And we need to learn to operate in those boundaries. Oh, that's important. Because I'll tell you, I am like the cookie monster. I want everything good that everybody else has. I don't want to do the work for it to maintain. I just want it all to come to me in my natural flesh. And that's wrong. We'll talk about that a little bit more. So let's get these boundaries set up. Uh, God spoke to Moses. And again, this is not Moses. This is God. God's doing all the directing. And um, Moses is an order taker. And we should do the same thing. Jesus, when he came to earth, said, my food is not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And so we need to let God direct our paths. So we find here in verse 2, command the children of Israel, when you come into the land of Canaan, this is the land that shall fall to you as an inheritance, the land of Canaan to its boundaries. Now, this seems like ancient history, and we're talking 3,500 years ago but you pick up the BBC news, you get your international newspaper, yesterday, today, tomorrow, the next day, will you find an article about this land and boundaries and disputes and settlers? This last week, they set up a new apartment complex in the east side of Jerusalem, causing all sorts of problems, and all the world gets ruffled like feathers in a, in a storm. And uh, this is current history. Well, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but I don't get too involved with what's going on with the boundaries and the Gaza Strip and uh, the West Bank and the eastern part of Jerusalem. Uh, pray for those folks, but God's going to take care of this land. He's going to take care of these boundaries. It will not be established by the UN, by our US president or anybody else. It'll be established by the Lord Jesus Christ. But they're going to get this land eventually. And here's what God promised them. And God's promises never are void. So this is the land. Verse 3, you shall have a southern border from the wilderness of Zin. And you can see that on your map. And uh, you're going to have that extend eastward to the end of the Salt Sea. That's the Dead Sea. The border is going to then turn from the south. Uh, to Then it's going to go up towards uh, Kadesh Barnea. And it's going to end up uh, finally to the brook of Egypt, which separates Egypt from Israel. And it shall end in verse 5 at the sea. What is the sea? The beautiful great Mediterranean. That's your southern border of Israel. As for the western border, it's the great sea. It's just go right along north up the Mediterranean. And that's your western border. The northern border from the sea, and it's going to go toward Mount Hor. And uh, he draws the perimeter along the northern side. And then verse 10, he brings it down the eastern side. And it's going to go right down along uh, there to the, uh, uh, to the side of the, the Sea of Galilee. And from there, it's going to go along the Jordan and uh, right back to where it started. So that's the land given to the nation of Israel. And uh, there have been many who've tried to play with that border. And even today, there are arguments about it. Um, but uh, that's going to be solved by the Lord Jesus. Right now, we just pray for peace and pray for salvation for Jews and Gentiles alike. Verse 13, Moses commanded the children of Israel, this is the land which you shall inherit by lot, which the Lord has commanded for the tribe of Reuben, verse 14, according to the house of their fathers, the tribe of Gad, according to the half-tribe of Manasseh, those two and a half tribes, they've received their inheritance on this side of the Jordan, so we got God to go along with our plan. Hallelujah. It wasn't God's plan, but he was compromising. 
and we talk about the permissive will of God. When I first got saved, I heard teachers talk about the permissive will of God. So I check and I see God's will is this. That's the perfect will of God. Um, how about plan B? If we got a permissive will, and then we try to maybe get a couple of permissive wills. Uh, I don't like God's perfect plan, but I like permissive plan part C, and I think we'll go with that. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to have what is not God's best? And there have been cases where God has, in a sense, seemed to have changed his mind. And so he did that with a wonderful king named Hezekiah, who, like all of us, did not want to go home. Oh, he wanted to go home, just didn't want to go home today or tomorrow. We all want to go to heaven, but who wants to leave in about 15 minutes? So Hezekiah, when God sent Isaiah and said, pack up your bags, you're dying. Oh, he cried. I've been good. I've done this. I've done that. And God relented. He had a permissive will. All right. I'll give you 15 more years. Hallelujah. He lived 15 more years, and he was a good and godly king over Israel for 15 years. But in that time, he brought forth a son who would then follow him named Manasseh. And Manasseh was the most wicked king, turning Israel away from God and caused them to go into captivity. Funny thing about people, there was nobody any more wicked than Manasseh until he got captured by Assyria. I told you about their coming in and taking them away. They put a hook in his nose and led him away. Oh, then suddenly he turned to God and he became godly and God gave him another chance and he came back, became a king and did all he could to serve God. The other king I mentioned who was wicked was Solomon. Started off with great wisdom. You can see it in Proverbs. Then he began to get discouraged, as you see it in Ecclesiastes, and uh, started off great. But when you got 700 wives and 300 concubines, and they're all coming in with their own faith systems, and you want to please the gals, then you start setting up their gods to Molech and to Baal and what have you, and he did his part to lead Israel into great sin. Well, we find now that Verse 16, the leaders are appointed to divide the land. The names of the men, uh, Eliezer the priest and Joshua, verse 17. Um, take a leader from each tribe. The one we want to look at is verse 19. The name of the man from the tribe of Judah is our beloved Caleb, the man of faith. Caleb and Joshua, the two priests who 38 years earlier had said, hey, yeah, it's got giants, but if God says we can take it, we can take it. So there's a great man of faith there. Uh, he's going to be at the age of 80, entering the promised land, and um, he is going to choose voluntarily the roughest, steepest, most mountainous, mountainous, most giant inhabited area of the land. There are some easy places and some tough places. He takes the toughest. Caleb, what a great man. I look forward to meeting him. And Joshua, another great man of God. All right, then we have all these leaders. Now, chapter 35, God does not forget about those who serve him. The Levites are not going to get any land. And of the Levites, the house of Aaron, the priestly tribe, will not have any land. They'll have no land, no crops to speak of. They're going to have to depend upon the people to give to them so they can maintain their work of serving in God's house much like it is in ministry today. So the Lord spoke to Moses, verse 1, command the children of Israel that they give the Levites cities to dwell in from the inheritance of their possession, and uh, you'll give them common land among the cities. So you're going to need to carve out some area for the Levites to support them as they support you spiritually in the house of God. Just like God says today, bring your tithe into the storehouse, your offerings to support the ministry so they can do the work of God. Uh, verse 3, they'll have cities to dwell in. Their common land shall be for their cattle, for their herds, for their animals. The common land of the cities, which you'll give the Levites, shall extend from the wall of the city outward a thousand cubits. A cubits, 
what, 18 inches, right? So 1,500 feet. Notice how specific God is. You'll take that measurement outside the city on the east side, 2,000 cubits on the south side. Two, so he actually has the amount of the land for the cities of the Levites to be given from the different tribes. So for those who want to serve the Lord, trust him to take care of you. So when you get into ministry, it's not like applying for a job. Now, you go to HR and a job, and you want to find out what the benefits are, and you indicate what you can offer them. But with the Lord, it's a bit different. God calls you. You don't sit down and say, now, what are you going to pay me, and how are the health benefits, and how much vacation do I get? You just simply say, Lord, here I am, and then he provides for you in the way that he chooses that's the only way to serve the Lord happily. Whether it's full-time ministry as a pastor or it's ministry, which I think is always full-time, even at your day job. We're always serving Him. All right, now, God's caring about those who are ministering in His house. He also cares about those who fall into the unfortunate circumstance of an accidental murder. Not premeditated, but accidental. Verse 6, among the cities... You're going to appoint six cities of refuge to which a manslayer may flee. And to these you shall add 42 cities. So all the cities you give the Levites will be 48, six of whom are for the cities of refuge. What's the city of refuge all about? Verse 9, the Lord spoke to Moses. It's always God. This is not Moses, it's God. Speak to the children of Israel. When you cross over the Jordan, you'll appoint cities of refuge that the manslayer who kills any person accidentally may flee there. You see, in that day, it was the um, idea of the Hatfields and the McCoys. You know that story? And I come from down Tennessee way, and that's where they uh, understood that stuff, way back in the mountains where I was born. You get my kin, by God, I'm going to get your kin. And, non and so it goes. I told the story that's apparently somewhere in a footnote of uh, Mark Twain's K uh, Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. A friend of his says, go to Knoxville, Tennessee for the weekend. It's a nice place to relax. Mark Twain then writes that he's in a hotel room, and suddenly on a Sunday morning, there's a shootout right down there on the main street. And sure enough, there is a banker coming one way, and there's a Templeton coming another way, and I was a Templeton. And so uh, they, uh, they had a shootout, and little Joe Templeton's up there in a second-story window, and he's shooting the banker, and then somebody's shooting little Joe, and what have you. And uh, Mark Twain said, so much for a peaceful morning in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, and so that was uh, my heritage. When, they, when my family sat down and said, this is who you come from, <laughs> that was a Templeton. And I wasn't the... John Templeton, who had all the money. That was the relative down in Memphis. That's another story. But um, in any event, uh, this is going to you need a place to, uh, to run. If you kill somebody accidentally, you're going to need a place to run. So they, they have these cities of refuge here. Try to dig that out for me. I want to see that footnote about that, about that uh, Sunday morning in, ten, in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, and so he says what happens is if you kill somebody accidentally, you run to the city of refuge before the kin kill you. That's the whole point of this Hatfields and McCoys, Templeton kind of a thing here. You kill one of mine, I'm going to kill you. And it was not, not an eye for an eye. You take my brother's eye out, I take your head off. You take my brother's head off, I take five of your kin. And that was the attitude they had. So God says, that's, that's crazy. If you've killed somebody accidentally and you can get it to the city of refuge before the vendetta from the kin then you are entitled to a fair trial. So verse 16, here the situation. You strike somebody with an iron implement and he dies. He's a murderer and the murderer is put to death. But if you strike him with a stone, that's all deliberate, then you, you die. You strike him with a wooden-handed weapon, at verse 18, you die. That was intentional. Uh, the avenger of blood himself shall put the murderer to death and when he meets him, he'll put him to death. If he pushes him out of hatred or while lying in wait, etc. He strikes him with his hand so that he dies. Uh, then the avenger is able to put him to death. Uh, however, verse 22, he pushes him suddenly without enmity or throws anything at him without lying in wait or uses a stone and it was all accidental. Then the congregation shall judge between the manslayer and the avenger of blood according to these judgments. So if the guy who kills somebody else accidentally gets to the city on time, then there's going to be a trial. 
if he's a slow runner, he's dead, right? But if he's a fast runner, he gets there, then they're going to have a trial. They're going to hear the case and see if it was truly accidental. You see how God has all these contingencies in mind. Um, so he's good. Uh, if he's found innocent, then he's fine. He stays there in the city until the death of the high priest who was anointed with holy oil. But if he steps outside the city for a smoke or just to get away from it all and the avenger is there, tough. Or as the British say, hard cheese, you die. So pray that you get to the city if you're uh, uh, in this situation. Pray that they exonerate you. Pray that the priest is old so that you get out of that city. If it's a young priest, you're gonna spend the rest of your life in that city. But God is providing for these situations. And our courts are filled with laws and statutes uh, largely based upon this situation. Um, not cities of refuge per se, but uh, verse 29, this is a statute of judgment for all your generations. Whoever kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death on the testimony of witnesses, plural. But one witness is not sufficient. Uh, it's got to be at least two or three witnesses. Uh, if you take no ransom for the life of the murderer who's guilty, you shall surely be put to death. You'll take one ransom, take no ransom for him who has fled to the city. So if you kill somebody, there's no ransom. You can't buy your way out of it. All right, I killed him deliberately, but here's a thousand bucks. No, we're not going to have that. Uh, you're not going to pollute the land, verse 33. Blood defiles the land, and no atonement can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of him who shed it. So God says when you kill somebody, you've defiled the land. Now your blood must be shed. So don't defile the land which you inhabit in the midst of which I dwell. I, the Lord, dwell among the children of Israel. Spiritual application. Jesus becomes our provision, and Jesus becomes our refuge. He's the provision for the analogy of the land. Where will I live? What will I wear? What will I do? Let Jesus provide for you your home, for your, your welfare of your animals, for your children, what have you. He becomes our provider, and then he becomes our refuge. And the devil is chasing us. The world is trying to get us. And the Lord says, get to the city of refuge before the high priest, and you will be safe. And if you and I get to Jesus Christ, who is our high priest, we are safe forever. Finally, chapter 50, uh, 36, remember those young ladies, Zelophehad's daughters who had no brothers, and they said, why should we not inherit our father's land because we're females? And God said, Yes, if there's no male to inherit, the females can inherit. So that, but what's, what's going to happen with that land? Uh, let's say that that land is in their tribe and they want to marry somebody from somebody else's tribe. Now we've got a problem. Because now their land, these five gals marry from other tribes, that land goes outside the tribe and God wants for us to hold on to the land that he's given us. So how are you going to handle that? Well, God's got an answer. The chief fathers of the families of the children of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, uh, etc. They said, uh, they said uh, verse 2, The Lord commanded my Lord Moses to give the land as an inheritance by lot to the children of Israel. And uh, these daughters were to get land. But for, here's verse 3, the problem. They're married to any of the sons of other tribes then their inheritance will be taken from the inheritance of our fathers. It will be added to the inheritance of the tribe into which they marry. So it will be taken from the lot of our inheritance. And then when the year of Jubilee comes, on the 50th year, then their inheritance will be added to the inheritance of the tribe into which they marry. So their inheritance will be taken away from the inheritance from the children or the tribes of our fathers. So there's a problem. So you go to God. Moses commanded the children of Israel, what the tribe of the sons of Joseph speaks is right. This is what the Lord commanded concerning the daughters of Zelophehad. Let them marry whom they think best, but they marry only within the family of their father's tribe. So here we are 3,500 years ago. Yes, there's no father, and we don't know about the mother, but these gals, uh, first of all, as far as arranged marriages, these gals are free to marry whom they want, but they're not to marry outside the tribe because that land will then pass to their husbands from other tribes and then this Manasseh tribe will lose the land. God wants for them to hold on to their land 
Again, think today, Israel and the struggle they have to maintain their land. Not taking sides, not pro-Israel, anti-Palestinian, but again, God's not really concerned about that now. He's drawing a church out for himself, but he's not amused by all of this business about the dividing of the land and the bombs and the fighting, etc. But uh, he'll get that all straightened out through Jesus Christ. That's the one who straightens everything out. All right, so they can marry whom they think best, but they'll marry only within the family of their father's tribe. Now, that's not a big deal because Manasseh's got, uh, who knows, 75,000 people, and how many eligible young men are there? There are thousands of young men available to them, so not a hardship. Um, The inheritance, verse 7, of the tribe will not change hands from tribe to tribe. So God's very clear about the borders. And he's very clear about my borders and your borders. The responsibilities that I have and uh, what's been given to me must not be taken from me, nor must I take yours from you as well. Um, Verse eight, every daughter who possesses an inheritance in any tribe shall be the wife of one of the family of her father's tribe. That way the land stays in it. So um, that's very clear. And so these girls, verse 11, Mala, Tirza, Hogla, Milka, and Noah, the daughters of Zelophehad, were married to the sons of their father's brothers. So uh, they married their cousins. They were married into the family of the children of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, and of course the land stayed right in the tribe. So that problem is solved. These are the commandments and the judgments which the Lord commanded the children of Israel by the hand of Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho. So ends the book of Numbers, and uh, we're going to then get into one more pass at all of God's laws called Deuteronomy, as Moses will tell completely in Deuteronomy, in a very interesting account, all that we've seen so far in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. It's called the second telling for the new generation so that they will know what to expect as they enter the land. For us, chapter 32, the tribe settling uh, uh, on the eastern side, don't go for what looks good, ask God what is his best and go for his best. Chapter 33, it's good to review and preview with the family where God has brought us, how he's blessed us, where he's taking us. Let's get rid of sin in our lives before it destroys us. Uh, The boundaries of Canaan, May we be established. It says in Acts chapter 17 that God is the one who establishes all boundaries and length of time for all nations. What nation is going to have what boundary and for how long? And that goes for families as well. And uh, we must learn to operate within those boundaries. Now, there's no harm in saying as Jabez prayed in Genesis, Lord, increase my borders. In other words, opportunities to minister, but within my boundaries. I'm not going to take from the pastor around the corner his sheep in order to increase my borders. But Lord, I have my boundaries and he has his and increase my borders and increase his as well. Bring, uh, not the borders, increase the opportunities for us to serve you. Chapter 35, I thank God that Jesus is my provision and he's my refuge and I run to him when I'm in trouble. And as far as the land is concerned, Lord, keep what I have within my family the precious Bible truths. May my children, my grandchildren, nieces and nephews embrace the Lord Jesus and the wonderful gifts that you have. Some of you have children and grandchildren and you have lived your lives serving the Lord and you want for your children not to lose that. You don't want for the devil to take that from them. So Lord, may we follow these principles and may we walk with you through Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.